Hi, this is a science uh, hangout from Science Mission. I am Sadashiva Pai. Today we are fortunate to have uh, Dr. Aditi Das, a STEM professor in the Department of uh, Comparative Biosciences at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign with us. Uh, she has done uh, extensive work on uh, some of the interesting stuff in the biology. Uh, she has won several awards. I'll name a couple of them because uh, I can go on forever if I talk about them. So in 2017, she won the best paper award from the Department of Biochemistry. And uh, 2016, uh, she was the invited member of the editorial board of ChemSelect, ChemPub Society Europe. Uh, 2014 to 2016, uh, she has the lightning talk, uh, lipid maps meetings, San Diego. And of course, like she has won several more of these uh, several awards. And uh, she's also authored uh, several publications, more than 35 publications. She's in the review board of uh, several um, journals. Uh, and uh, she's uh, one of the accomplished uh, researcher in our field. Welcome, uh, Dr. Das, to hang out. Thank you very much for this opportunity to give a talk on my research. I'm very excited to share this with you. Uh, can you tell us about yourself a little bit, uh, about your background, education, etc.? So I did my bachelor's at St. Stephen's College, Delhi. Mm -hmm. Then I went on to do my master's from IIT Kanpur in chemistry, both in chemistry. Uh -huh. uh, after that, I was briefly in IIT Delhi, followed by my PhD at Princeton University. Uh -huh. And uh, after Princeton University, I came to Urbana-Champaign to do my postdoctoral work, mm -hmm. uh, which was in collaboration with the Northwestern Nanotechnology Center and Beckman Institute. Uh -huh. And after that, I joined the faculty position here. So this is so my training, primary training, has been in India, and then rest of the training in the U.S. Okay, uh, like uh, tell us about uh, like since uh, you have a very brief uh, research career. Of course, it runs into almost a decade or more. Uh, can you tell us about your mentors or the role models which uh, supported you in your career? So my first mentor was my uh, professor in my master's during in IIT Kanpur, Dr. Sabrisachi Sharkar. He was he always trained me to have a very open-minded approach and think out of the box. Mm -hmm. And he also told me if a question cannot be answer, answered this way, there are many other ways you can approach a question and try to answer it. Mm -hmm. And I think from him, I have become a I feel I've become a more a go-getter with scientific questions, and I know mm -hmm. the different ways of looking at one question. And okay. then my PhD mentor gave me a lot of space to explore what I want to do, and mm -hmm. that training helps me a lot. So Professor Michael Hecht at Princeton, uh, he would always encourage, and he would always uh, tell us what do we want to do, and that made us think and progress in our project. And my, mm -hmm. uh, my postdoc mentor, Professor Steve Sligar, uh, he was um, like motivation for mm -hmm. the science. He was a very versatile scientist, and, and he has taught me to be extremely versatile. So okay. these are my three primary mentors, and, I, and then I look up to Linus Pauling. <laughs> oh, OK. OK. And I know you are a busy scientist, and uh, other than research, you have any other hobbies or other things you do? Yes, so I was, uh, I am a musician. I'm a classical uh -huh. vocalist. And okay. uh, I've trained for a long time with uh, Ms. Sumitra Guha, who's right now a Padma Shri Award winner. And uh -huh. I have also been in Norway as a musician in the Rick's Concert in, uh, Music Group. So, um, so that's been my interest, which is classical music, folk music, and I'm a vocalist. Okay. And uh, coming back to the research part, like, can you talk about a little bit about your lab and your uh, students, uh, their projects, a little bit about it? So my laboratory right now, I have uh, seven graduate students, and uh, mm -hmm. my lab focuses on lipid metabolism by mm -hmm. cytochrome P450 to make uh, anti-inflammatory molecules. 
So we are a so I uh, imbibe the same principles that I learned from my uh, PhD and postdoc advisor. So mm -hmm. my students get their own project, and then they have mm -hmm. uh, they also are allow you know they are also encouraged to come up with their own project in their third fourth year so that they are innovative. They can bring mm -hmm. their thoughts. So that's how I run my lab uh, at Comparative Biosciences and. Mm -hmm. um, Yes. Yeah, so, so, and I have graduated three PhD students, and um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So let's let's so hear let's about, your, hear about presentation. your presentation. Sure. Yeah, definitely. Okay. So. Okay. I'm going to talk about the novel anti-inflammatory bioactive lipids, which are coming from the CYP epoxygenase pathway. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I want to first talk about why, are this why is this important. So if you think of all the different diseases, people study the different diseases separately. But what is common between vascular disease, Alzheimer or Parkinson disease, pain, arthritis? So the most common theme in all these diseases is inflammation. So inflammation is a common unifying component in many of these chronic disease conditions. So the, the idea of my lab is that if we can find molecules that can control inflammation, not only reduce it, but even fine tune it, then we can have an integrated approach towards trying to tackle all these different disease states. So if you think of acute inflammatory response, you do need that. You do need inflammation because inflammation is a natural and a protective response to specific insults such as injury or infection. For instance, if you think of what is really inflammation, so like vasoconstriction, vasodilation, vascular permeability, chemotaxis, addition, these are all part of the acute inflammatory response, which is very important. But the problem arises when this inflammation does not resolve. So what I mean by that is when the acute inflammation becomes chronic inflammation, and this chronic inflammation is what we are trying to tackle, is what we are trying to reduce. So this is a concept popularized by Professor Charlie Sirhan from Harvard, and that is the concept of inflammation resolution. What is inflammation resolution? The inflammation resolution is an active process in which you resolve the acute inflammation by removal, restoration, regeneration, remission, and relief. And what molecules do these inflammation resolution? These are the novel lipid mediators. So our interest is to look for many different novel lipid mediators which are endogenous in your order to resolve the inflammation. And one of the therapeutic implications could be to increase the levels of these molecules or make derivatives of these molecules which can resolve inflammation. So these are the two major goals. So how are these lipid mediators generated? What are these? Like lipid mediators, what do they mediate? So these lipid mediators, they all come from the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids that you consume. So you always hear the uh, papers that um, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids are good for your health. You should have DHA supplements. Uh, this is going to reduce depression. This is going to do this. This is going to be good for your cardiovascular health. This is going to reduce cancer, neurodegenerative diseases. So the question that comes to mind is how can one class of uh, pharmaceuticals or food item, which is omega-3 fatty acids, can do so many different effects? This implies that there is a common biochemical pathway where the omega-3 fatty acids are getting converted into these lipid mediators, which in turn are controlling all these different diseases and as I mentioned before, these diseases have an inflammatory component. So these lipid mediators are controlling the inflammation, and that's why they can affect all these different diseases. Go uh, into the more uh, scientific understanding of what happens when you consume omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. 
So omega-6 fatty acid and omega-3 fatty acid, when they are consumed, they start getting incorporated into the lipid bilayer, as shown here. So we are essentially what we eat. So a person can change his body's lipid composition uh, by consuming more omega-3 fatty acid over time. These omega-3 fatty acids are stored in the membrane until there is an injury or insult or trauma that induces phospholipase A, and phospholipase A releases these fatty acids from the membrane. So this is the omega-6 fatty acid and the omega-3 fatty acids classified into EPA and DHA. So what happens to this EPA and DHA further? There are three pathways that these molecules go through, and these molecules now then can control the inflammatory response. So the first pathway is called the cyclooxygenase pathway. And all of you are familiar with this pathway because this is the pathway that is blocked by all the NSAIDs, such as motrin, Aleve, Advil, aspirin, everything. So what does this pathway do is it makes prostaglandins. So it takes omega-6 fatty acids, makes omega-6 prostaglandins. It takes omega-3 fatty acids and makes omega-3 prostaglandins. And it's our cyclic fatty acids, and they are, they are pro-inflammatory in nature. The second pathway, called the lipoxygenase pathway, synthesizes leukotrienes. And these molecules are also pro-inflammatory. The lipoxygenase pathway is the target for a lot of anti-asthma drugs. And therefore, this is also a targetable pathway. So while both cyclooxygenase and lipoxygenase are targetable pathway to reduce the inflammation in the body, there's another pathway in the body, a little bit neglected pathway, because this pathway you cannot really block because it makes these molecules, which are all anti-inflammatory and vasodilatory. So they're beneficial for your health, essentially. So what this pathway does is it takes omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids and converts them to these corresponding omega-6 and omega-3 epoxides. Unlike the COX and the LOX pathway, the EPOX pathway is a completely anti-inflammatory pathway. So this is this anti-inflammatory pathway, and EPOX are cytochrome P450 epoxygenases. So what are cytochrome uh, P450 epoxygenases? And that's what I'm going to further talk about today. So the outline of my talk will be talking about the biochemical mechanism of the cytochrome P450 epoxygenases, focusing on their ability to metabolize lipids and form epoxides, as well as showing how certain cardiotoxic drugs actually mediate their effect from, by the, through the cytochrome P450 epoxygenase. And then I'm going to talk about the discovery of novel anti-inflammatory lipid metabolites and then how do they affect pain, multiple sclerosis, and pig, piglet neuroinflammation. And I, although I'm not going to talk in details about these, but these are the ongoing studies. So first, let me talk about the biochemical mechanism of the cytochrome P450 epoxygenases with respect to their ability to metabolize lipids. If you think of human cytochrome P450, you would be surprised to know how many of these are in your body. There are 57 human cytochrome P450s. There are few which are orphan, especially the ones in the brain. People think of cytochrome P450 as drug metabolizing enzymes, but they have multiple functions. Functions that are performed by cytochrome P450 are drug metabolism slash xenobiotic metabolism, Secondly, they are involved in steroid synthesis, and that is a very regulated process. And thirdly, they are involved in fatty acid metabolism, and that is the enzyme class that I'm talking about. So we focus in our lab on uh, cardiovascular cytochrome P450s that are also extrahepatic. So these cardiovascular cytochrome P450 are 2J2, 2C8, and 2C9. So this 2J2 protein is highly expressed in the cardiac myocytes in humans. The function of this enzyme by Daryl Zeldin was shown to convert omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids into epoxides. Aragonic acid 
the CYP2 J2 converts this to all the regioisomers of these epoxides. So it forms one, two, three, four regioisomers. These are called epoxy eicosatrienoic acids, or also known as EATS. If you can see, this enzyme is highly expressed in the heart muscle tissue, as well as in the cardiovascular system, the relative mRNA levels are very high. So if you think of the white as a human cardiomyocytes, then the, the dark gray is the human heart. So in the... Hello. Hello, I lost you. Vascular function is it lowers blood pressure. Uh, the second thing it does is prevents post ischemia, cutipulon arrhythmia, and then it's also implicated in cardiovascular health, cerebrovascular health, such as stroke. So, what I mean by that is these epoxides are very important in reducing um, hypertension, and therefore, there are many drugs that target this pathway for reduction of hypertension. Also, if there are drugs that will interfere with these enzymes and its production of the epoxides, then those, dr those drugs could be cardiotoxic too. So the next one is we are going to talk about this 2J2 and our studies with this uh, protein, 2J2, and put this into this nanodisks. What nanodisks are, they are like sushi-like uh, molecules where, the, where you can think of the analogy as the lipids are the rice, the fish in the middle is the membrane protein, and the seaweed is the membrane scaffold protein. So this is a way to stabilize membrane protein so that you can get very good quality biophysical uh, data from this and understand the protein in a more native-like form. Express cytochrome P452J2 in E. coli, we also expressed its redox partner called cytochrome P450 reductase in E. coli as well and incorporate them into nanodisc and challenge them with these different fatty acids. So arachidonic acid, uh, linoleic acid, icosapentaenoic acid, and docosahexaenoic acid. And we were able to make the EETs as well as we were able to make, make the heats, which are the hydroxy. And then we detect all of these molecules using an LC-MSMS method that we also develop in the lab. So what we were able to show in this paper, which is published in biochemistry, was that the arachidonic acid metabolism is high, and but when we have the other fatty acids, then they have a tendency to inhibit arachidonic acid metabolism. Uh, so this shows the direct metabolism rate, which are very comparable to each other, and they do make it in a very slow turnover rate, and that's important because we don't, these molecules control heart rate, and we don't want to make a lot of these molecules, so they are made in a slow quantity, slow amounts. We found that DHA actually inhibits the arachidonic acid metabolism and is a preferred substrate for this enzyme. So what I mean by that is as I add increasing amount of DHA, the arachidonic acid metabolism goes down and DHA instead gets metabolized. So if we had a down one omega-3, omega-6 fatty acid, the DHA would have been a preferred substrate. But because the Western diet is more omega-6 fatty acid, then it's overwhelming amount of arachidonic acid. So DHA cannot inhibit in that case. So to further show, these, all these fatty acids are very similar structurally, then why are, they, um, like, why are they binding differently to the active site? So we, show, we did this molecular modeling with MR Stoshkoshin's group, and that in case of DHA, DHA is interacting with three residues in the active site of this protein, which is threonine-318, arginine-321, and serine-493. And if we mutate out two of these residues, then this selective preference of DHA for this protein goes away and, be, and it behaves exactly similar to arachidonic acid binding to the protein. So here we show that we make a double mutant where DHA 
uh, firstly inhibits in the wild type 31%, and then the inhibition of DHA goes away. So those residues are critical for giving DHA its selectivity towards binding this protein. So after we have learned that, we were very interested in how cardiotoxic drugs uh, bind to this protein and change this fatty acid metabolism. And we focused in doxorubicin. So there was a paper which caught our attention that was from a John Supers group in Canada. His paper said that CYP2J2 overexpression protects against doxorubicin damage. Doxorubicin is a very popular anti-cancer drug and it's also very cardiotoxic. There has been many ways that people have tried to get around this cardiotoxicity, but understanding its complete mechanism is very important. What doxorubicin do in the molecules is here is can produce reactive oxygen species. And that's what people think is the main um, or main mechanism by which doxorubicin is toxic. But our hypothesis, which is I call it the alternative hypothesis, is in addition to producing reactive oxygen species, doxorubicin also inhibits 2J2 and decreases, therefore that leads to decrease in cardioprotective epoxides. So with this hypothesis in mind, we went ahead and did some of the experiments where we took 2J2 and saw how the doxorubicin can inhibit the metabolism of fatty acids by 2J2. So doxorubicin has this uh, tendency that this bond falls off and it forms this molecule called 7D adox. It is very well known that doxorubicin uh, has a prolonged cardiotoxicity means even after doxorubicin dosage have been stopped, then also the, the patients can have cardiotoxicity. So this implies that doxorubicin forms some metabolite that stays around in the membranes of the cardiovascular system that can further cause cardiotoxicity. So with that goal in mind, we wanted to figure out what really happens to the doxorubicin, what does it do to the primary cardiac cytochrome P450. So we first showed that doxorubicin inhibits 2J2 and inhibits quite a lot. Then we also showed that the 7DA dox, which is formed as a metabolite from doxorubicin, also inhibits 2J2, but not completely. And if I take a 50-50 person ratio of 7DA dox and doxorubicin, then I get an intermediate inhibition. So the first study was to show that doxorubicin and its primary meta metabolite, 7 da dox, they inhibited 2J2-mediated arachidonic acid metabolism. What was another thing that we observed, which was interesting, was that the regioselectivity selectivity changed. So what I mean by that is that I told you before that there are four different video isomers being formed. That's 5, 6, 8, 9, 11, 12, and 14, 15 EET. But doxorubicin changes the ratio of these uh, EETs. And that could be important because these EETs, mm -hmm. the different EETs, have different functions with respect to their cardioprotection. So if you are changing the levels then, and the um, like video isomer ratio, then we are changing the cardiotoxicity potential of the drug. You know, in collaboration with Emata Shkosh's group, which is done by Javier Balin, uh, the 7D adox and arachidonic acid can simultaneously fit in the active site. So here I'm showing, this is the product, and this arachidonic acid. Now arachidonic acid cannot bind to its original way, so now it's binding in a different way and producing a ch change in the regio selectivity. So we And we showed that 70A dogs can bind to the active site and modulate the regio selectivity of arachidonic acid metabolism. And this is very interesting and physiologically important as well. Now, if this is true, that 70 adox can change the regioisomer ratio, then maybe we can show that with doxorubicin analogs, which are less toxic, that this does not happen. Those two um, 
Doxorubicin analogs, 5 immunodonorubicin, or short form is 5 IDN, and zorubicin, which is ZRN. Both of these drugs were obtained from National Cancer Institute, so we are very thankful for giving us the drugs for the studies. So we were able to show that 5 donorubicin was as inhibitory as doxorubicin. For instance, there is a lot of inhibition, as you can see. While on the other hand, uh, zorubucin, which has a large group in this, this part of the molecule, uh, is less inhibitory than uh, zorubucin. But in both cases, like both 5-IDN and zorubucin, the change in the regio, regio isomers was not very much. So what I'm showing in the right figure, uh, let me walk you through this, is that regio selectivity change and the fold change. So with doxorubicin, we get a change in the region formation of the more of 5,6-ET and less formation of 14,15-ET, while in ADOX, we get more formation of 5,6-ET, less formation of 14,15-ET, but just notice that zorubucin and 5-IDN do not change regioselectivity, although they inhibit. Molecules were giving us support for the proposed mechanism that doxorubicin gets converted to 78 ox and the 78 ox then binds to the active site, changes the regio isomer of arachidonic acid metabolism. So, this is the summary of this work where I'll just walk you through the. It is cytochrome P450 reductase, the redox partner of 2J2, converts doxorubicin into 78 ox, which is the product. But this product, the body gets rid of very easily because it's more hydrophobic, so it's lingerons. And you can bind to 2J2, shown in dark purple here. And then when 2J2 binds arachidonic acid, it not only reduces the uh, like rate of metabolism, but it also changes the regioisomer ratio. For instance, 5-6 going up, which is thought to be cardiotoxic, 8-9, and these are more the cardioprotective ones. The cytochrome P450 reductase, CPR, the redox partner, metabolic adox, and 70 ADOX binds to 2J2 and alters the preferred site of metabolism of arachidonic acid, leading to change in the ratio of the regioisomer. And this work was done by William Arnold. To talk about uh, the uh, epoch sites themselves. While I talked about so far, how a few are familiar with cannabis, the uh, they generated are in and what is the bio? So, THC is an inflammatory approved for many of like drugs, all synthetic for many is the which is chemotherapy, and it has also been approved for treatment of migraines and epileptic seizures, joint pain, and stiffness. These collectively are known as phytocannabinoids. Phyto means they're plant based cannabinoids. Autonomous production of similar kind of molecules. So when uh, scientists first discovered the fight, uh, then the next question was, why does the human body have so many receptors to recognize plant phytocannabinoids? There must be an endogenous molecule very similar to phytocannabinoids. That to the, led to the discovery of anandamide in 1992 and 2 glycerol in 1994. Right, which is derived from the word ananda in Sanskrit means happiness, it's a happiness giving molecule, and it binds to cannabinoid receptor one, it's a partial agonist. So, these molecules they all both bind to cannabinoid receptors and do a lot of functions, and among them are neuromodulatory and immunomodulatory actions. So, where do these endocannabinoids come from? The, there is an omega 6 endocannabinoids. And these omega-6 endocannabinoids, as the name suggests, come from omega-6 fatty acid. And if you can see that this is a very clever way that nature works, there is just an ethanolamide moiety here, and they have such different pharmacology. 
So the anandamide are derived from arachidonic acid, and 2 arachidonic glycerol is derived from uh, arachidonic acid 2, and these are the differences they have in their uh, modifications. So anandamide and 2-AG have been shown to be anticonvulsant, psychotropic, as well as anti-inflammatory. So with the increasing consumption of omega-3 fatty acid, the question was, do these form omega-3 endocannabinoids? So this is a paper from Alexander Macrianis's group, who is a leading expert in the field of these endocannabinoids and different kinds of drugs related to that. Their lab showed that, yes, DHA gets converted to DHEA, very similar to anandamide. make new uh, anti-inflammatory molecules. So this is the pathway. Uh, again, there are these three enzymes, the cyclooxygenase, the cytochrome P450 epoxygenase, and the lipoxygenase pathway. So what has been shown by Larry Marnett's group that cyclooxygenase converts the anandamide into prostaglandin EA. Prostaglandin EA has very different pharmacology from prostaglandin, just because it has this part. And then um, another group showed the lipoxygenase has converted anandamide to 12-peroxy ethanolamide. And this is also a leukotriene with a different pharmacology again. So our group and Natasha Snyder from Paul Hollenberg's group have shown that anandamide gets converted by the cytochrome P450 to form all the regioisomers of, uh, of EET's EA. So these are the ethanolamide epoxide dual functional molecules. I was further interested, and after we published our first paper, which, where we talked about that anandamide gets converted to EET EAs uh, by cytochrome P450, we were interested in omega aminoids gets metabolized by cytochrome P450 to form omega-3 endocannabinoid epoxides. So these are very similar to these molecules, except that they are the omega-3 versions. They're also very similar to these molecules, but the fact that they have an epoxide. The advantage of these molecules is they have they are bifunctional. So they have an epoxide group as well as an ethanolamide group, and that can make them very interesting, and these can go through multiple different signaling pathways. So we, for in order to study these, the, we had to synthesize um, uh, these molecules and develop an LCMSMS method. So these are all the regioisomers of uh, EPA, also known as EQEA, and these are the different regioisomers of EDP, which are coming from DHA, so the DHA-based products. So in order to synthesize them, uh, we synthesized, we added DHA, we did an MCPBA reaction, make the epoxides, and then we ethanolamide couple them to form this EDPEA. And then we uh, developed a separation method where we looked at their separations into these different regioisomers using some of the uh, standards from Cayman chemicals. And, uh, and then we were able to separate out all these regioisomers. So, so this shows the targeted lipidomics method that we used or made to separate these molecules. And this shows how these fragments have overlapping masses. For instance, 1718 EQ EA and 1415 EQ EA has overlapping masses as well as fragmentation pattern, but they have different um, dilution time in the LC. So we used we use the ABCIX 5500Q trap machine to do these studies. So we were able to develop a targeted lipidomics method to look at all the different uh, regioisomers of the epoxide. So our first question, are these epoxides in the body or are they just a figment of imagination? So there is a lot of things that people can do in an in vitro cell in cellular system that is make new uh, molecules. And uh, 
by using different enzyme systems. But artists found endogenous clean the body was the first question in our mind. So we went and did tissue analysis of rat and especially of the rat brain. And we also did all the organs. We also actually first discovered these molecules in pig brain. And then we also found this in human blood. So what we did here was we took uh, the, um, in the, in the, in the rat brain, we found that these molecules are actually ex expressed or found at equal levels to anandamide, which is the most studied endocannabinoid. And that implied that maybe these molecules are doing something in the brain. And then we also found 17, 18 EQ, a little less amount than 19, 20 EDPA, but they were also there. We also were able to find these molecules a lot in the different organs, especially in the kidneys. So kidney has a lot of the cytochrome P450s, and therefore it made a lot of these epoch sites. And kidneys also involved in controlling hypertension. And as I mentioned before, these molecules are implicated in reduction of hypertension. We were able to also see these in the human uh, pooled human plasma set that we analyzed uh, in uh, good enough quantities. So next, we were interested in who forms these metabolites. So omega-3 endocannabinoid metabolism, we were interested in is 2J2 that synthesizes it. Is that, are there enzymes in the brain microsomes? Or are these activated microglia, which are synthesizing that? So similar to the approach that we took before, we took 2J2 and CPR, put this into a nanodisc, and then we challenged that with DHEA and NADPH saw that, then we saw that this were getting metabolized and the terminal endocannabinoid was forming the maximum amount of these epoxides. sites. And then we, then we made a ratio of how many they're forming. So it seemed the terminal was 76.5% and then 8.7% five and 3%. So they are less and less, but the terminal one is the most predominant one. And this shows here the rate of metabolism, which is faster than arachidonic acid, similar to anandamide metabolism. Next, we showed similar study with the uh, EPEA, uh, uh, like as the parent compound, and similar to DHEA, the terminal epoxides were formed the highest quantity. Here again, the rates were similar to that of the DHEA. But in the pig and the rat brain microsome, there are more cytochrome P450 than 2J2. So does the brain have the enzymes or the capacity to metabolize these molecules? And they do. So we made with a um, very standard method of making brain microsomes. We cut some brains and we made microsomes. And we were able to show that both EPA and DHEA were getting metabolized and producing similar ratios as we were seeing with the purified enzyme. So one of the important things is to use an activated microglia or where is the production of these molecules coming from? Because endocannabinoids are implicated more for their neuroprotection and uh, modulatory effects, we wanted to see if these are produced by microglia. Does activated microglia co convert them into these epoxides? So in order to do this study, uh, we use BV2 microglial cells. What are microglia? Microglia are macrophages of the brain. The function of the microglia is to reduce the inflammation in the brain and to take care of it. And, uh, and because they're the macrophages, they're usually not found in the brain in a large quantity all the time, but only in a disease state. Most of the diseases that you think of, which, uh, which relates to the brain, for instance, Alzheimer, Parkinson, multiple sclerosis, all these diseases are accompanied by a lot of neuroinflammation and the microglia gets activated in those cases. So we took uh, EPA and challenged it uh, and gave it to uh, BV2 microglial cells, which is the activated microglia. And again, very similar to the brain microsomes and the purified enzyme, we were able to make all these metabolites. So are these metabolites really made or do they, are they already stored? There's a different way of making it. So we used a simple study where we had the metabolites formed by the BV2 activated microglia, and then we added an inhibitor 
called ketoconazole, which is an inhibitor of cytochrome P450. And we were able to show a decrease in the production of the, of the metabolites, which showed that the cytochrome P450s are involved in the metabolism of these EPA and DHEA in the microglial cells. Next question was that these metabolites, once they are formed, who degrades them? Because if they are so good, they might linger around in the body for a long time and reduce all the inflammation in the body. But they are taken care of by more downstream enzymes. So we looked at the metabolism by soluble epoxide hydrolase. What soluble epoxide hydrolase do is it hydrolyzes the epoxide bond. So soluble epoxide hydrolase essentially converts these epoxides into the hydroxylated form. And this is the rate of the formation of these epoxides into the hydroxylated form and that of the 1920 EDP. Next, we look at another enzyme called fatty acid amide hydrolase. Again, as the name suggests, its function is to do an amide hydrolysis, which is it converts this um, ethanol amide part into the fatty acids, so 1780. And then we also measured this using RAT4 brain membranes, which highly express this protein, that we were able to show that these get metabolized by fatty acid amide hydrolases. This question was now that what is the functional implication of these, uh, of these molecules? So we find these molecules, they are are formed by cytochrome P450, they are degraded by soluble epoxide, hydrolase, and FA. But then what is their function? What are they doing in the body and the brain? First, we wanted to look at their functions with respect to their endocannabinoid-like property, which is binding cannabinoid receptor 1 and 2. What are cannabinoid receptors? Cannabinoid receptor is primarily thought to be two major classes. There are more receptors which people think are there. There's still a lot of research going on in those receptors. So cannabinoid receptor 1 is mostly found in the brain and is involved in the psychotropic effect of cannabis and similar molecules. On the other hand, cannabinoid receptor 2 is found mostly in the immune system and it's implicated in anti-inflammatory action of cannabinoids. On the right, you see here is the distribution of the cannabinoid receptors. You can see cannabinoid receptor 1 is a lot in the brain, a lot in the gut, uh, while the cannabinoid receptor 2 is, is all over the body. There was a recent paper in Nature Reviews which said that CB2 selective agonists, that is cannabinoid receptor selective agonists, are therapeutic, a target for pain management, immune system modulation, without the overt activity of cannabinoid receptor 1. So there was a lot of interest in synthesizing cannabinoid receptor 2 selective agonist, which will, um, which will have all the anti-inflammatory property, but will not cause a psychotropic effect. So there was some observation we made from a previous work done by Snyder and Hollenberg that when anandamide is converted to the epoxide, this epoxide actually is very selective cannabinoid receptor to agonist. So if you notice on the right here, this shows radioligand binding. So we are looking at the specific binding of the CP55940, which is a strong agonist of cannabinoid receptor 1 and 2. So here we see that with respect to cannabinoid receptor 1, the anandamide binds it much better than 5,6-ET. But 5,6-ET binds cannabinoid receptor 2 more potently than cannabinoid receptor 1. So what this shows is there is a class switching means that the anandamide, which is more cannabinoid receptor 1 selective, becomes a cannabinoid receptor 2 selective when cytochrome P450 converts the anandamide into the epoxide, indicating that maybe under an inflammatory condition, when the cytochrome P450 levels goes up, then they convert these molecules into more anti-inflammatory molecules to attack the inflammation. So we, also should, we were now going to ask the question that, is this true? for the omega-3 endocannabinoids. So we took the omega-3 endocannabinoids and we were able to show that that's true for the EPEA epoxides. Like while EPEA binds to cannabinoid receptor 1 more than the cannabinoid uh, receptor 1 compared to the 1718 EQEA, but the cannabinoid receptor 2, the 1718 EQEA shown in purple binds better than EPEA receptor class switching and the endocannabinoid epoxide show a cannabinoid receptor to preference. 
but there's just not one epoxide. There are many of them. The DHEA epoxides, there are at least six of them, while for the EPA epoxide, there are five of them. So we were further interested, like what is their interaction with the different cannabinoid receptors? And we were able to show that they now mine very differently with all the different receptors. And uh, uh, like the CNR1 response for the different regioisomer is different, CNR2 response is different. For instance, if I look at EPEA, which has CNR, it's binding to CNR1 and 2 almost similarly, but and so is the 8,9 EQEA, but then the 14,15 EQEA is different. This data is more dramatic with that of the DHEA epoxides, where we show that DHEA, which does not bind to either of the cannabinoid receptor 1 or 2, very importantly, but one of All this So all uh, CNS diseases, they have activated glia. And these play uh, a lot of key role and potential therapeutic targets in neuropathic pain, epilepsy, neurodegenerative diseases, ALS, stroke disease that you can think of. So the next question was that what are the anti-inflammatory studies in microglial cells? And we were able to show that we two microglial cells that IL-6 production and an increase in the IL-10 production for both the terminal and the And finally, we were able to show that the regioisomers are different from each other, and these are ongoing studies. And the last thing we want to show is the vasoactivity of the endocannabinoid epoxide, that do they have epoxide-like qualities. In order to do these studies, we took bovine coronary artery vasodilation studies, where we took a coronary artery, chopped it into smaller pieces, and we were able to take this and measure the hypothetical. And finally, the bovine coronary artery vasodilation studies showed that they were able to dilate the vessels, very similar to the parent compounds. In summary, what we have shown is that naturally occurring omega-3 endocannabinoid epoxide are formed via the SIP epoxinase pathway. The endocannabinoid epoxides maintain their endocannabinoid-like activity by binding to Endocannabinoid epoxides are CBT preferring and all the regioisomers are anti neuroinflammatory and increase in the IL-10 production. They also maintain their epoxide-like activity for dilation and angiogenesis. And favorable pharmacological properties make them attractive targets for biomimetic for treating inflammation pain and cardiovascular disease. So in summary, I talked about the biochemical mechanism of the cytochrome P450 and then discovery of the novel anti-inflammatory lipid metabolites. So I want to acknowledge the people who did the work. The people who the, did the primary work with respect to the mechanism is William Arnold in the lab. Uh, John B. Roy, she did a lot of work on the effect of these molecules on cancer in osteosarcoma, and the work is right now being written up. Josephine did a lot of work on figuring out what is the protein involved in the metabolism. And Daniel McDougall is the first author in the PNN paper and the one who led the story of the effect of these endocannabinoid epoxide in inflammation. 
for funding, I want to thank National Institute of Health, National Institute of Drug Abuse, and NIGMS. And I want to thank a lot the American Heart Association, NSF, and the Foundation. Thank you very much. If you can unshare the presentation, double click on the yeah. So it's a very very good presentation. There was a lot of noise at the end. I don't know where the noise was coming from. Yeah, I think there was some disturbances in between too. Like I mean, like you are cutting off in between, but it is okay. I think overall it sounded good. I mean, like uh, the presentation was very excellent. So do you know who what who was talking at the end? I think that end was quite uh, like I don't know if um... uh, it it looks good. So uh, like I have a couple of questions. If you don't mind, sure, sure. I think you need to unshare again. I think your sharing is still the Google app. Okay. Screen. Okay. This this looks good. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now, 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 now you, we can see you. Uh, like uh, oh, okay. in in the first first part, basically like the mechanism part. So right. can you can you inhibit by drugs to modulate one or the other forms like those sites? Uh, yes, I wish. So so I think the CYP two J two specific inhibitors yeah. are. In progress, as well as the crystal structure of the cytochrome P450 2J2 is in progress. Okay. And right now, there is no way to selectively control the epoxide formation. Uh, okay. But I think people are working towards it. Oh, okay, that's that's interesting. That's what like I was thinking. Like if you can modulate what you want, like by changing some of these residues or whatever way, targeted way, you can do it. That would be really useful. Right. Uh, and. Uh, Second, second part is uh, really the second part regarding uh, because I have done a lot of brain related work. It is kind of very interesting in terms of um, uh, in mm -hmm. terms of like pain and neuroinflammation and all those things. So, how, what is the directions you are looking at basically currently in that aspect? Yes, so we actually have multiple directions in that project. So, we are collaborating with multiple groups. Mm -hmm. One is these molecules we think are implicated in pain. Mm -hmm. So, we are collaborating with some pain groups to see if these molecules can be elevated and that does that reduce pain by using downstream inhibitors. And then we are also working in collaboration with the multiple sclerosis group, where we are trying to see if these molecules have any kind of, you know, repair mechanism that they can do. For instance, you know, repair the myelin sheet or maybe prevent the myelin sheet from degrading. So mm -hmm. and then we have, uh, we are also looking at neuroinflammation model, like piglet neuroinflammation model, that if you feed them DHA, do you make more of these metabolites? So all these processes are right now ongoing. So therapeutic implication could be making derivatives of these molecules as drugs or increasing the levels of these molecules by using inhibitors. Uh, do, do they have any effect on blood-brain barrier or anything like that? Like trying to open uh, up the blood-brain barrier or anything? So that is a good question. We haven't tested it, but mm -hmm. I think they cross the blood-brain barrier because there are lots of DHA uptake, uh, uptake uh, proteins. Mm -hmm. And these are very much like DHA. Okay. Okay, because I saw a recent paper I saw a recent paper on some of the immune cells entering the brain. Uh, I don't know. It is in our uh, science mission website. Recently, I posted it. I think yesterday or today, basically. Mm -hmm. So you, you might want to have a look at it. Like uh, they disrupt the blood-brain barrier and all those things, like different way of entering the uh, right. brain. So since it is uh, related to brain, so I thought I will bring that up. And uh, maybe it might be useful for you. Yes, yes. No, I would uh, take a look at that. Uh, and again, thank you so much for your time. This holiday, you are coming out and uh, doing this. Uh, we really appreciate it. And if anything, something interesting comes up, let us know. We'll be happy to host you again. Uh, oh, thank, thank you, thank you so very much. Bye-bye. Okay, happy Thanksgiving. Th same to you. Thanks.